today. Mm-hmm. We've read Mike Florio's article, Cowboys Have a Contract Mess with Three Different Stars. And Florio is joining us now on the DNM Leasing Hotline via ProFootballTalk.com. Good morning, Michael. How have you been, sir? I've been great, guys. How are you? Doing well. Well, mm, I'm in okay. Huh? Since Friday, it was... Friday was a little rough for me. Welcome to my world. Man. Welcome to my world. <laughs> what is your strategy in dealing with social media hate? Ignore it. Do you ignore it, though? Because you seem like a responder. Sometimes. Sometimes I just do it for fun. Sometimes I do it fully aware that I'm just trying to stir things up and I'm trying to make things entertaining. You know, like Russell Crowe and Gladiator. Are you not entertained? Is that not why you're here? One thing I've learned, and it only took me 15 years. I'll give you a quick example. The other day I posted an item about Kirk Cousins who was on the Big Shack podcast and he said he's going to do everything in his power to deliver a championship to Atlanta. Now, in the story I wrote, I pointed out that he notoriously refuses to work on Tuesdays during football season and I raised the question, does that mean he's going to work on Tuesdays now? Because the great ones are all in every day to try to do everything they truly can to deliver a championship. You don't take one day of the week off completely from football if you're trying to win a championship. When I posted the story on X, I left out the snark about Tuesday. And so if I had put it in there, all the responses would have been dragging me for being a jerk about pointing out that he doesn't work on Tuesday. (laughs) By leaving it out, all the responses were about him not working on Tuesday. (laughs) So there's a nuance to how you work social media. But the reality is they're always going to look for something negative. The question is whether you give them the negative thing they drag you for or you lead the horse to water and let them drag someone else. Let's talk about this uh, this article in terms of the Cowboys' contractual mess. How did we get here? And how surprised are you? Because a couple of hours ago, Florio, I said, yo, man, w- w- what I expect from Jerry and Steven are to be expert businessmen, to win negotiations, to have the Cowboys in the best spot because they're a legendary billionaire business Family. That will be Jerry Jones, in my opinion. That will be uh, what he is most known for, uh, for his football legacy. And it doesn't seem like that has happened. And here we are now. Well, I'll say what I said on our show, PFT Live, which is on Peacock, 7 to 9 a.m. Eastern. You can get the replay later after you listen to Sean and RJ. I'm not trying to take away any of your numbers. They can catch ours later. There's plenty of capacity out there for people to listen to or watch everything they want to listen to and or watch. Here's the reality. The Joneses have done great things for the sport and for the Cowboys. And I think it's far more impressive that they have kept that team more relevant than any other for 30 years without getting to a single NFC championship game than it would have been if they had built another Super Bowl champion in those 30 years. To have that team as popular and relevant as it is without high levels of tangible on-field success really is amazing. That sounds like an insult within a compliment, and maybe it is. Here's the real insult, though. Despite everything great they've done, when they get in these situations with highly talented young players who have earned second contracts, they are one, cheap, two, short-sighted, and three, not nearly as smart as they think they are. Mm -hmm. Because they have dragged their feet to their detriment with Dak, they're doing it with C.D. Lamb, and I feel like it's coming with Micah Parsons. And with Dak, look, look back to after the... 2018 season. He's got three years in. He was a fourth-round pick. Day one started because of the Tony Romo back issue. And he checked every box. He did everything he should do. They made him play out the fourth year of his contract under a $2 million or so salary. And they did it because they could. Then franchise tag. We do it because we can. Then he breaks the ankle in week five or thereabouts, right, of the franchise tag year. Is that right? Yes. Yes. That was 2020 season. And, and he uh, – is that right? Am yeah, I getting yeah. my years right? Yep, yep, Am I right. getting them right? You're right. Okay. So then – so it doesn't matter that he had a broken ankle. The ankle's healed. He's heading into his second franchise tag. And that's when they realize we're kind of screwed here. We've waited this long. He can just play out his second tag. We'd have to give him a 44% raise to tag him again. We can't do that. They give him that four-year, $160 million contract, which had a fuse in it, which was going to have a huge cap number this year and no way to keep him around next year. They created this mess by dragging their feet, and now the tables are turned. These great businessmen who always take advantage of every piece of leverage they have, they're at the mercy of Dak Prescott now. 
They were at the mercy of him last year. They weren't able to work out a long-term deal. They're at the mercy of him this year. They can't work out a long-term deal because they don't want to pay him. And I think that next year he's going to be like Kirk Cousins. He's going to hit the market. We're going to see who else will pay him more than what the Cowboys are offering. And I think there's a certain amount of a, of a bluff here where, you know, they hide behind this idea. You play for the Cowboys. You make a ton of money in off-field deals. You can waltz right into the number one booth at any of the networks as a former Cowboys quarterback. Everybody wants to play for the Cowboys. There's value in that that we think we should get credit for. <laughs> they overplay that hand, and I think they're going to overplay it again. Mike Florio, ProFootballTalk.com here on 105.3 The Fan. Your other headline is, will the Cowboys draft a quarterback? What are you hearing or what are you thinking on that? Well, I think it's a situation where when you make out your board, and it's a challenge because you're looking at every position. You've got needs all over the place. And the Cowboys have an aging team in a lot of key areas. They had a great offensive line for a long time. How much longer is Zach Martin going to – be there. You know, the offensive line isn't as great as it was in its heyday. You have to make that better. You have to deal with the defensive line. DeMarcus Lawrence has been around, what, 11 years now. And I think if you're not going to have Dak Prescott in 2025, well, and you don't know that you're not going to have him, but you have to plan for the possibility that you don't. We don't know what they think of Trey Lance. There haven't been a lot of leaks that they love Trey Lance and they think Trey Lance could be a starter. If they don't think Trey Lance can take over, they better have somebody if they're getting ready to go for 2025 at the quarterback position. Now, when you got a coach who's a lame duck, you may not have a coach who's banging the drum for a quarterback. You want to use all your picks on guys who are going to help you win games and save your job. But I think big picture, whether it is we actually need a replacement or we need to have Dak think we have a replacement so we've got better leverage in these conversations, they got to have a viable plan B for Dak Prescott come 2025, or they're going to pay more than – they would like to pay if at the end of the day they're going to pay whatever it takes to keep them around. Mike, you cover the national scope more. How did the league react when the Packers did this twice? The same process. When they did what? When they drafted a quarterback when they already had one. Like, were they like this stupid? Like, how did the national, what was the national well, scope on that? Well, you got to remember in 2005, Brett Favre was already three years into his annual will I or won't I retire routine. He started that at like age 32. <laughs> he was talking to Peter King in like 2002, 2003 timeframe, musing about retirement. I was like, what the hell? Brett Favre's talking about retirement. So they had to be ready for him possibly walking out the door unannounced. That's why they used that pick on Aaron Rodgers. And also he fell down the board to them in the 20s. How can you say no to a guy that you – think will be a great player when they did it more recently with Jordan Love it was I think a manifestation of several different things one of which is Aaron Rodgers is getting older and number two I think Mark Murphy the CEO of the team realized that if this pisses Aaron Rodgers off and gets him to buckle down and do everything he needs to do and look at what he did he won two straight MVPs after they made Jordan Love a first round pick traded up in round one to get him so you know the Packers get a lot of deference in that regard because they've managed to string together far to Rodgers and now Jordan Love, who looks pretty good. Different reason for the Cowboys to be doing it. This isn't a future Hall of Famer so far in Dak Prescott who could be walking away, but this is about having a plan in place so you're not caught unprepared if 2025 rolls around and you don't have a quarterback because Dak Prescott has exercised his option to go play for another team. Because that's the thing, the way this contract was negotiated, there is nothing they can do to keep him from leaving other than make him an offer that he accepts. Mike, we try to repeat this to the Dak Prescott haters, but I just want to see if you give more confirmation. If Dak Prescott hit the open market, would he definitely get his $60 million from somebody else? It remains to be seen because we don't know which teams are going to be looking for quarterbacks. We don't know what the executives and coaches and owners of those teams think about Dak Prescott. We don't know where the market is going to be a year from now. But it used to be unprecedented for a quarterback in his prime or close to his prime to hit the open market unfettered and unrestricted. Kirk Cousins was the first one to do it in 2018. It seems like now there's a lot of guys every year, far more than there used to be, who are available in free agency. But Cousins got $100 million fully guaranteed from the Falcons on – a, a multi-year deal. 
And I don't know that Dak gets 60, but I think what the Cowboys are banking on, and I think they've come to terms with this. They're never going to admit to it, but I think they've come to terms with the reality. We know what we're willing to pay Dak, and we're willing to bet on the difference between what we'll pay and what someone else will pay, not being big enough to get him to not be the Cowboys quarterback because even though it's hard to get players to give you a break and they shouldn't give you a break financially because everybody's subject to the same salary cap, there is value in being the Cowboys quarterback. So somebody else is going to have to overpay. And I think their guess is going to be no one else is going to overpay by so much that that Dak will leave. The book is Father of Mine. You can check out Mike Florio's Mob novel set in 1973. You can go find it everywhere. ProFootballTalk.com is the website as well. What did you think of what I uh, had to say about Micah Parsons last week? Well, I, I saw it over the weekend, and I saw it came from you, and I thought, well, this is interesting. This is interesting for a variety of reasons. Flagship radio station putting some stuff out there, and we know that Michael Parsons hears everything, responds to things, isn't afraid to mix things up on social media or elsewhere. And, uh, yeah, it was intriguing. I reached out to you. You basically said, what took you so long? But <laughs> I, I think that I, – I, look, here, here's my take on it. And, and, and I do think there's a fascinating conversation to be had about not, – and, and look, I, I'm not going to say that the Cowboys used you as some sort of a patsy to put this out there. You put it out there because you were hearing it. Fine. But what have they done in response to it? This is coming from their flagship station, a station that Jerry Jones is on twice per week. There's an extra legitimacy that is embedded in what you said. What have they done, if anything, to throw water on it? I haven't seen anything by the Cowboys to try to throw water on it. And I think the bigger issue is this. If he's wearing thin on the Cowboys, if there's things he's doing that they think is a pain in the ass, so what? He's Michael Parsons. <laughs> he's this yeah. generation's Lawrence Taylor. Do some research on the stuff the Giants dealt with with Lawrence Taylor. This pales in comparison to the things that other teams have looked the other way on when you're talking about superstar players. And my headline was, I think, if the Cowboys believe Michael Parsons is wearing thin, they need to thicken their skin. Who cares? Let him say and do whatever he wants. Now, it'll be interesting to see how he and Mike Zimmer get along if he's going to be popping off to the media about coaching issues like he did after the loss to the Packers. But this guy is Michael Parsons. He's a superstar. He gets the privilege that goes along with it. And usually that entails, you know, making excuses for a guy who does antisocial things off the field that could get him arrested. For the stuff that could be wearing thin on the Cowboys, who cares? He is a generational talent. You find a way to deal with it. You one of the things you mentioned just now, and then you mentioned it in the article, and and Sean and I didn't really understand what you were saying because you mentioned the flagship, and they, you said that was interesting that this was coming from the flagship. Like what? What are we missing? What What does that have anything to do have with? A, you have a guys have a contractual relationship with the Cowboys. There's a line that if you guys cross it, you got a contractual problem with the Cowboys. They start calling up and complaining to your bosses. Look, I got a relationship with the NFL and NBC. If I say things the NFL doesn't like, they call up and complain about me. I mean, it's dangerous water to swim in. That's the point. And because there's that built-in relationship and because we've got so many media outlets out there that are owned and operated by teams and leagues now, that becomes the first thing that people in the business at a minimum look at and say, hmm, this isn't some – you know, independent, completely and totally free from any potential influence from the Cowboys media outlets saying this. This is somebody where there are tentacles from Frisco that are involved. And, and again, on the front end, the question is, did the Cowboys have fingerprints on this story in the first place? And then on the back end, it is, what have the Cowboys done to try to take some steam out of this because it has that extra piece of legitimacy. What is the juiciest draft storyline that you're paying the most attention to right now? I, there's so many. We talked today about this Caleb Williams thing where Greg McElroy, of all people, was <laughs> suggesting that he's never faced adversity or some <laughs> nonsense like that. And I, I and, and Caleb Williams felt compelled to respond on X to it. I, you know, this is what happens when you don't have an agent. Number one, if you have an agent, the agent's the one who will deal with Greg McElroy in a discreet but very effective way. And Lamar Jackson, I think, fell to 32 in 2018 in part because he didn't have an agent 
to fight the Bill Polians of the world who were saying he should play running back or receiver, whatever Polian was saying. But secondly, somebody needed to tell Caleb Williams, look, you're going to be the number one pick. Don't, I mean, you don't need to push back against Greg McElroy for saying you've never faced adversity. Just let it go. So that, that to me has been short-term interesting. And the bigger picture thing is how are these quarterbacks going to fall out after Williams at one? Who's going to be two? I think it's Jaden Daniels, but you hear all sorts of things. And then after that, the next four guys, when do they go? Is it five in the first ten? Is it six in the first ten? Who's going to be giving up too much to trade up to try to get a quarterback? Who's going to stay put and hope that a quarterback falls to them? Who's going to get leapfrogged? you got the Broncos at 12, the Raiders at 13, the Vikings at 11. you got a lot of teams looking for quarterbacks, and you only have so many to go around. It's going to be a lot of fun seeing how it plays out two weeks from tonight. Really enjoyed the articles. Thank you for the time and the perspective. The book is Father of Mine, Mike Florio, on the DNM Leasing Hotline. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, guys.